This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Hello, and welcome back to the podcast for 2021, and a happy new year to you. I wonder what this year will bring for us all. I'm kicking off the year on the podcast with an interview with conservationist and wild meadows expert Keith Datchler. We talk about the state of our wildflower meadows, their importance for biodiversity, and where we as humans fit as part of the biodiversity that feels at home in meadows. Keith spent many of his holidays as a youngster with his grandmother in the countryside. Those trips sparked an interest in meadows that still exists to this day. Even as a city kid, I always used to say to people, yeah, I want to be a farmer. And it was an experience in my youth, lying in a fantastic hay meadow that was going to come back and haunt me later when I started my commercial farming life. Because as a commercial farmer, a young commercial farmer, dead keen to produce, and and that was life, you know, produce, produce, produce at all costs. And then we took back in on the estate that I was managing a very small farm that had been incredibly neglected, so much so we didn't really know what the heck to do with it. And it was a February, so we shut it up for hay. Came back in the June, and it was a sea of wildflowers. And it's one of those moments where the hairs on your arms move, you don't really know why. I knew nothing about wildflower windows. But it was clear that this was somehow touching me, and it was a very special environment. So it had to be protected, and this is long before stewardship and all the schemes which now protect land. So we we set out to do just that and protect it. So one of the things that we did just, just to protect it and have some kind of commercial income was to let it to somebody who wanted to create more meadows. And back then, the way of creating more meadows was hay strewing. You'd make hay on a meadow, that uh, uh, was species rich and you'd take that hay and you'd spread it somewhere else and the seed that was remaining in the hay would create you your new meadow, which was great. And we also tried that. And that just sort of kept things ticking along, but it was really a hiding to nothing. And it was a very, very slow process. And everybody kept saying to us, well, but it takes years. It takes years. That's why these ancient meadows are so precious. We only have 3% left, so we have to protect them. Um, and stewardship came along and we thought, well, yeah, we're going to stewardship. And again, the first thing stewardship asked us to do was to create more of these meadows using hay strewing. And it, it simply took too long. And as a farmer and coming from that era of produce, 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 we thought, you know, there has to be a better way. So we we set about creating new meadows as though it were a farming practice. And and thinking of haymaking, you cut it and it knocks it around, so seed falls out, and you turn it and some seed falls out, and then you bale it and some seed falls out. And this was the product you were being asked to use as a seed source. So it didn't make any sense at all if what you wanted to do was plant another meadow. So we actually harvested the seed, but complete. We cut the hay very gently and then picked it up, complete with all its seed, and took it to another meadow and spread it. And we had really good results compared to hay strain. And then we thought, well, let's give it a little bit of help and create some bare earth. So we harrowed it to create at least 50% bare earth and then did it again uh, the following year. And we really were getting amazing results. So what we got was a system now of creating new meadows. So where we've been bashing ourselves on the head with this doomsday story of only 3% left, um, that's all fine and dandy, and they're ancient. But you can forget the word ancient. You're you're never going to create more ancient meadows. (laughs) But if you can create biodiverse meadows, does it matter if they're not ancient? So it's the biodiversity that counts. So this is what we set out to do. And uh, it's been quite successful. And now, of course, you know it's, it's almost old news. There are wonderful um, incentives and initiatives like the Coronation Meadow Programme, organisations like Plant Life um, that have set about creating new meadows all over the country. And I've been fortunate to be a part of that. 
and also the Wild Meadows Partnership, which is a, a small organisation here in the corner of, of uh, Sussex, but has created hundreds and hundreds of acres of wildflower meadow, new ones. And they're just as good. They're biodiverse. That's the thing. I mean, maybe not just as good, but they're full of plants that encourage it, pollinators, and it's insects that can. You think of conservation, it's a pyramid. You've got the soil at the bottom and everything that grows in it. And when I say grows in it, I mean literally under the soil, the mycorrhiza, all the insects, all the bacteria. And that has to be right. And if that's right, the plants will be right. If the plants are right, the insects will be right. And if the insects are right, the birds will be right because you've got seeds, you've got insects. And so yeah. it goes on up the pyramid until you get to the raptors and the, and the major birds and ourselves, of course. Indeed. So we're talking about meadows. What is the actual definition of a meadow? That's something everybody has pondered on and struggled with. I used to be a trustee of the Grassland Trust, and it, it was the Grassland Trust, but of course we we felt meadows, you know, it's, a, it's a bit more interesting. Sounds nice, a meadow. But what is a meadow? A meadow is a semi-natural grassland. So you have to go back to think, how were they created? And you had grassland and you had truly wild grassland. But as soon as you enclose it and you begin to farm it, you're managing it. And what will survive in that field, meadow, grassland, it is all the plants that are suited to the management that you have imposed upon the area. So if you're haymaking or grazing, and those management factors will influence what grows. So a true old meadow is an area of wild grass that has been brought into a form of management. And the things that survive are the things that suit that management. And this is what we would call the semi-natural or species-rich grassland. And I think that is probably a meadow. But there are many, many different types from Scotland to Cornwall. And that local diversity is very, very important to protect. So local provenance seed, if you're creating a meadow and you want to be true, that's very important. You mentioned 3% is what we have left of our ancient meadows. Mm -hmm. When do they date from, those that are ancient? I think it'd be very difficult to put a specific date. But species-rich biodiverse meadows were common until the outbreak of the Second World War because farming hadn't really improved that much. Chemicals, fertilisers, you know, sprays, insectic the insecticides, the herbicides, all of those things hadn't had a major impact until around the start of the Second World War where we had to have a big push to feed the country. And that push really has carried on. It's as though... In a way, no one's ever told the farming community the war's over. Um, and I think we are now at last waking up to the fact that we have to protect this biodiversity. You know, we are, we are, not perhaps or maybe, but we are at the verge of an extinction crisis. And people of my age, and I'm in my seventies now, and people of my age will remember going on holiday, if you're lucky enough to go on holiday and be driven, um, but going on holiday in the 50s, the big problem would be all the squashed insects all over your car and all over the windscreen. And suddenly that has gone. You know, we don't get that anymore. So if we don't get that anymore, what are the birds eating? No wonder we've got a crisis. And the, these small little animals, insects, and they're vital. They're vital to our to our overall nature picture and that is a sign you know it's a sign that anyone in my age group will recognize and we should wake up and listen and, and that's why this you know not cutting grass verges is such a good idea and, and a no-brainer really because it saves money and you're allowing grasses to complete their natural cycle. So not only are you allowing grasses to complete their natural cycle, everything that lives and depends on that grass will complete its natural cycle. So it's a, it's a no-brainer. Never mind improving the biodiversity. Just let it grow. 
and, and it will improve its own biodiversity over a long period. Or if you have a group, as we're lucky enough to have here in battle, uh, wild battle, uh, you can start to actually interfere and increase biodiversity, which is even better. But the big thing is just stop mowing. It doesn't make sense. It's just a tidy factor. And until we had flail mowers, we didn't mow anyway. Again, if you go back into the 50s, look at old motoring videos or films, uh, grass verges aren't neat and tidy and bright green. Uh, they're just an extension of the natural world. So you don't mow them at all? Maybe once a year. Okay. Yeah. But again, it's a management and, um, you know, we, we don't live in wild Britain, although it would be quite a nice idea. We don't live in wild Britain and we're never going to, but we need to be sympathetic and we need to get close to it. There are lots of things popping up on the verges. There were during lockdown. That was quite interesting to see what had, was emerging. And you can tell, I think sometimes that they, the verges do date back a lot longer than you assume because of what pops up if you just leave it alone. Mm. That was that mm. was a really interesting exercise, I felt. Meadow fragments. Mm. They, the fact that it's a roadside verge, it's outside agriculture. So it hasn't suffered some of the vagaries that grassland would have suffered if it had been asked to produce huge amounts of grass for huge amounts of milk to feed our ever-increasing population, which still has to be done. You know, you've got to be a realist. You know, we've still got to feed ourselves. But... We can do that and we can be sympathetic on areas like that. And we need to keep everything connected. The fact there's only 3% left, it's fragmented by design. You know, so how can things move from one area to another? And with any form of animal, if you isolate the gene pool, you will get colony collapse. So we need to connect everything together. Roads by design are linear. So... They help with that yeah. tremendously, along with all the other in initiatives with Stewardship and Woodland Trust and all these wonderful organisations that exist, thank goodness. Obviously, there will be probably catastrophic effects for humans if we do allow biodiversity to collapse in thinking about the wildlife side of it. Mm -hmm. Is there any argument for keeping and preserving meadows and ancient meadows from a purely well-being point of view for humans? Oh, without a doubt. I mean, we, why are we doing it? And we don't preserve meadows for meadows' sake. Well, it's certainly not in my opinion. This isn't meadows because we have to have meadows, um, because we want to tick a biodiversity box. Meadows are intrinsic part of the human consciousness we're a grassland species ourselves. And that sounds a, a weird thing to say, but we came down out of the trees, stood up and walked to exploit the African savannah grasslands. We walked out of Africa and conquered the world based on grassland. And we still are, because if you think of wheat, barley, oats, rye, rice, maize, they're all grasses. So we are still a grassland species. So no wonder when you walk into a field, which looks as it would have looked, and it pricks that human conscience and the hairs on your arms move. I think it's a, a latent memory, which is possibly even in our DNA, that this is a sign of well-being. This is a sign that everything's okay. When all that wild wildness when all that wonderful tapestry of colour is eaten out, perhaps because you're following a herd of cattle or wild animals, it's the time to move on. And when you find the next valley or hillside that looks amazing, it's the time to stop. It's always that, that indication that everything's all right. This is well-being. It, it, it actually almost defines well-being. And flowers and that diversity, I think, trigger our brains. It, they're so important to us and have been throughout the centuries. You, you, it's the, a key thing at a wedding. And we take them to the dead. It's what you do if somebody dies. It's the ultimate offering of love and care. So 
flowers and the floristic content of nature, I think, touch our human consciousness far more than we can imagine. And we're not a, a, a created species. If you think of your dog, it was a wolf 30,000 years ago. It's been bred and inbred and rebred, and it's now a Chihuahua or a Pekingese or a Great Dane. But it'll still turn a circle on the living room carpet to crush the reeds before it sleeps at night. <laughs> Is that oh. what they're doing? I didn't realise that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they turn the circle. Yeah. They're creating their bed in the, <laughs> in the reeds. Wow. Um, we're like that. You know, all of those things exist in us. Fight or flight is the one that everybody knows. Um, your hands go wrinkly if they get wet for too long because it increases the surface area and you have more grip. How many times have people bringing up children when the child is teething and crying for its mother and you're parents are saying oh don't go up to it don't go up to it you know must let it go to sleep and but someone's got to go you know so a parent will go up and the child will stop before you get to the door it's crying for its mother it recognizes its mother's footsteps and that would have been a survival tactic you would have had to kept quiet if somebody you didn't recognize came towards you so we're full of these things mm. and that is why we are still an animal, we're still a species. And we have to do these things for ourselves. It's not meadows for meadows' sake. It's meadows for our sake. It's nature for our sake. If you took all the humans off the planet, the, the planet would recover pretty damn quick in geological terms. You know, I watched the squirrels burying acorns on our lawn. So if, if we all disappeared... We came back in 200 years' time. That's an oak forest. We only think of life within our own sphere, our own 70 allotted years or whatever. But it's a blink of an eye. It's nothing. And we can't, we can't cock it up for everyone in that brief period that we're given. You know, you've got to hand it on. You've got to hand it on. There's a, there's a tribe of uh, folk in, in Africa and, and they live on a particular route. And they hunt for this root. And when they find one, they leave it. Because that's for their children. And then we find another one, they leave it too. Because that's for their grandchildren. And they'll take the third one. And if you think of that ethos, is that if what I'm about to do is going to make it more difficult for the people that will come after me, I, I won't do it. As an ethos, if you replaced all the religions in the world with that simple ethos wouldn't be bad. Obviously, we think on the human scale and sometimes it's difficult for us to get out of our immediate, you know, bubble, I suppose. And thinking of that, can we recreate meadows or establish meadows in a domestic setting? Or do we need to be thinking about them at a larger scale and for the longer term? both we can we we need to have it as much as we can on farms you cannot have a situation where you're going to produce enough food to feed nations uh if every farm and every piece of grass is a wildflower meadow uh, i understand that and i wouldn't even advocate it but i would say that you can have an area, whether it's meadow, woodland, scrub, every, every farm's got a corner that doesn't do so well that, that could have such an area. And if you can think collectively so those areas can join up, uh, it, it's got to be, it's got to be a good thing. And on a domestic scale, I think exactly the same applies. And here in battle, we have this wild battle group, which is brilliant and it's concentrating on roadside verges. They are connective by design but there are gaps and there are many many more households with gardens so if every household has i don't know square three or four square meters and concentrates on creating as much diversity within that area as possible but that keep that diversity natural keep it local you know plant a don't plant a budlia you know, yes, you'll get lovely butterflies on it, but it's not actually doing huge amounts of good. You want things that attract 
pollinators. Pollinators are life. If we don't have pollinators, you don't have life. Um, I forget who it was, but somebody said that if you all the bees disappeared, the humans will be gone 18 months later. Hmm. Uh, th- th- these are dramatic statements, but they're beginning to ring true as you look around the planet. Um, we're, we're a tiny, tiny little island. And yes, we've only got 3%. In terms of land mass, I think that's less than 1% of our land mass is wildflower meadows. So it's tiny, but it's essential. And it's it's the thing that enables so many other specific things to continue and survive our insects, which are vital. But do, yeah, do it in your garden. And if you if you can't make a meadow, leave a patch of singing nettles. Meadows are the flavour of the month, uh, year, decade, especially in terms of public planting, mm-hmm. um, public schemes. Yeah. If you wanted to install one on a domestic setting, is it easy to do? I wouldn't say easy, but it's if you start with a small area, it's like anything you do. If you get rewarded, then you're likely to do a bit more. So start with a small area and just experiment. Get a small amount of seed, create your, your bare soil, choose the worst part of your garden. The, the bit which has low fertility. Low fertility is very important for getting these things to establish because grass will outcompete nearly everything. It's a thug. So if you've got a fertile patch, if you, if you suddenly decide you're going to grow a wildflower meadow instead of your vegetable garden, you're probably on a loser because your vegetable garden would have had a lot of inputs. So choose the worst bit. Maybe a piece of grass which you've endlessly mowed and taken the cuttings away and it goes brown and it looks awful. That's the bit. That's the bit. Put it, create bare soil there and put some wildflower seeds down and see what happens. And if you don't get a great deal of success, do it again because we're at the mercy of the weather. Look at the summer we've had. So people wanting to establish some of these areas this year done at the wrong time, it would have been a complete failure. So you don't want to spend hundreds of pounds doing it on half your garden. You want to hone your skills like anything else, get it right on a small area, and then move out. You'll get more confident. You'll have the reward of seeing what you've done. But, yeah, it's possible anywhere. And I would say even in a window box. Right. Yeah. And do you need to be careful about where you source the seed from? You mentioned about local seed. Local provenance is essential. I was fortunate enough to be involved with the Coronation Meadows project, which was plant life. And that was the key thing. We wanted a new meadow, a new biodiverse meadow in as many counties of England as possible. And we wanted to protect that local provenance. So we very, very carefully sourced local provenance seed for each of the individual counties and that was absolutely crucial Mm -hmm. yeah you don't want to mess things up they're there for a reason if they've developed in your county or on your soil it's because that's the thing that likes it there yeah stick stick with what's local very important we are very lucky to have some amazing meadows nearby Mm -hmm. us here obviously it's important to get people to interact with them but from a conservation point of view and thinking about things like increased footfall, is it to be, are people to be encouraged to go and visit them? I think without a doubt. One of, again, let me hop back to the Coronation Meadows project. One of the criteria that Plant Life had was that each meadow had to have public access. It had to be on a public footpath. That doesn't mean that the public walks 12 abreast through the middle of it. it it's there to be seen. The project we have here in Battle, the, the area, that, the biggest area that we've been working on, we've created a, a wandering, meandering path through it, right through the middle. It wants to be inviting. You want to invite people in, not say, keep off the grass. You actually want to keep on the grass policy and invite people in, let people see it. It's beautiful for six to eight weeks. It's one of the snags with meadows. If they looked all the time, as they look for that six to eight weeks, you wouldn't have this whole uh, initiative. It wouldn't be necessary. People would want it. But, yeah, it needs to be everywhere, especially in cities. I mean, people suffer in cities. You, know, you need nature. We really do need nature. And 
with, with part of the meadow project was to put a, a meadow in Green Park in the middle of London. So that there is a, a meadow now in the middle of Green Park. Hyde Park has some really interesting um, diversity in it. Yeah, bring it into the cities everywhere, roadsides, cities. These are the patches where you can make a connection to people and allow people to make that connection. And is there public and government support or does, is there, there more is, needed? There is public and government support and certainly everything when I was farming and my farming life uh, wouldn't have been possible without the stewardship agreements and the the payments that came for putting nature first. So if you put nature first, you may have to obviously put the pro- productivity second and you have to be compensated for that it's a business nobody would expect a factory to make cars and uh, pay a financial penalty for any form of natural connection so you know if you're a business and farming's a business and you're going to suffer because of what you do for nature then i think that compensation has to come and if there were more more people would do it. It's as simple as that. And, uh, but again, you know, obviously economics apply. You have, you can't just pour money endlessly into anything. So there, there is a balance to be had. And I do worry that coming out of Europe, that that balance may tip away from nature. Thank you very much to Keith for taking part in the interview. I suspect this is not the last time I'll talk about meadows on the podcast, particularly in a domestic setting. I find myself conflicted by them. They're biodiverse and ancient, but ultimately human-created. They clearly have a pull on us, but are we doing the right thing by creating bastardised Disney versions of them in public plantings? If you want to hear more on that, I refer you back to episode 77, More Than Weeds with Sophie Legill. Meadows have a visceral and subconscious effect on us as humans, and we have an affinity with them, along with so many other species. Could they be a habitat that creates maximum harmony between species? Before I go, I'd like to apologise for the hiccups on a few of the recent episodes where the music played over Dr Ian. Because of the generous and lovely Patreon subscribers, I'm now able to pay for someone to look after that particular problem. So hopefully it won't happen again. So thank you to the Patreon crew. You are amazing. I love you all. And thanks to you for listening. I leave you with Dr Ian Bedford talking about winter bumblebees. Winter's now well and truly here, and spending time working in our gardens can sometimes seem a bit of a chore, especially on those cold, damp and miserable days. But when there's a few winter flowering plants to see, we'll be reassured that our gardens are still alive, and that before too long, it'll be springtime, when the beds and the borders will be bursting with fresh new growth. Those winter flowering plants can also remind us that spring won't just signal the start of a new growing season, but the return of insect life, and in particular, the buzz and hum of the bees, since, as surprising as it might seem, during those bleak winter days, worker bumblebees might occasionally be visiting the winter flowers. Surprising, because in the life of a bumblebee colony, the founder queen, all her worker bees, and the males would be expected to have died before the onset of winter, leaving only the new queens in a dormant state of hibernation until spring. However, one of our most common bumblebee species, the buff-tailed, is a little different from the rest, in that it nests underground, maybe in a deserted mouse hole, or within a compost heap, where the bees are insulated from the cold and where the colony can generate enough heat to remain active and survive during winter, enabling the worker bees to go out and search for pollen and nectar even during the coldest days when snow lay on the ground. Leaving their warm nests to forage, though, is not without risk, since the longer the bees are out searching, the more energy they'll expend, and the more likely they'll become weak and succumb to the cold. However, we could always try and make life a little bit easier for the buff-tailed bumblebees by adding more winter-flowering plants to our gardens 
which should then shorten the foraging trips and increase the odds of the workers returning safely back to their nests for a little bit longer each winter. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast.